Hey there. Hi. How's everybody doing? All right. How about yourself? Good. Hanging in there. Thank you for coming in. So I'm Aaron Mesh. I'm the news editor here. Uh, so this is the endorsement interview for Senate District 41. House District. House District 41. We got the 41 part right. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, so just a few ground rules so everybody understands how this works. This is a 30 minute interview intended to help us understand uh, who you are, what differentiates you, and who we should endorse in this race. It's not a debate, so um, you know, we aren't going to ask two of you to talk to each other necessarily, although we may ask one of you to ask the other a question at some point. You're welcome to engage with each other, of course, like it, but there's no like wall between you or anything. But to, please be respectful of your fellow candidate. Um, we just, not equal time, which means that there's a possibility that we might ask one of you a question and follow up and get into a little bit of a rut for a minute. And I ask the other of you to just be patient for that time and we'll get back to you. And because the goal here is to help us and our readers decide who to vote for. Sure. Uh, without further ado, why don't we get started? Um, Mr. Castile, why don't you introduce yourself and tell folks a little bit about the district? Yeah, appreciate it. Um, well, my name is Calico Castile. I go by he, him, his pronouns. Um, I grew up in the district uh, in Milwaukee, so I went to Linwood Elementary, Rao Middle School, and Milwaukee High School, graduated in class 2005. Um, you know, the district is a place where I've called home for a really long time. Obviously, my parents still live there. I have a lot of friends and family that still live in the district. Um, it's something that's definitely going through a change over time. It's, um, I've, I've heard a lot of people refer to it as old Milwaukee versus new Milwaukee in that um, we sort of have a lot of multi-generational families who have been there for a very long time, uh, who are a lot who are now being sort of priced out, who are no longer being able to live there. A lot of those are my friends, and we're now finding themselves in Oregon City or elsewhere, um, even out of the state. Um, but it's a really awesome community that I, I love, and, and I've sort of I was uh, voted most spirited in high school, so I very much love the the community and I'm all about it. Um, but then I also. Um, you know, for me, I'm running because the community right now, there's 50% of the students in Milwaukee High School are students of color. So I do think that the future of the district does look more like me than folks that typically run for this seat. Uh, and I think it's really important for students who are growing up in this district to see themselves and folks in elected office and ultimately, you know, have elected representatives to sort of share that lived experience rather than just talking about them. So for me, that's one of the reasons why I'm representing or running because I believe that representation matters and the, the demographics of this community are shifting right now. What do you do for living? Thank you. I wear a few different hats. Right now I'm the Director of Development and Communications for a nonprofit here in town called Brown Hope. Uh, I just started there a couple months ago. I also run my own small business called Thunderstorm Strategies, where we do digital marketing, um, social media, and website development for both cannabis companies, but as well as political campaigns. Um, and then I also am currently the president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. So we are the main national trade organization focused on getting black and brown entrepreneurs uh, involved in the cannabis industry. Um, and I started as an intern for Normal. I've ran a political action committee and uh, ran a dispensary as well. I've done a lot of work in the cannabis industry, but for me, I feel like that sort of gave me a lot of uh, experience that I feel like is necessary for a lot of the big problems we're looking at right now because you need to be able to pull stakeholders together that don't necessarily agree on the same issue and be able to pull them around to, to make progress. Great, thank you. Mr. Gamble. Thanks for having us. Um, well, I was a uh, commercial and editorial photographer for several years. I, one of my clients was National Geographic. Uh, and that's sort of what led me into politics. I was seeing the uh, effects of climate change 20 years before they were predicted to start to occur. Uh, and I wasn't seeing anybody necessarily at any level of politics that was doing what we should be doing to address it. So I think about 15, well, no more than that. Probably 17 years ago, I got involved in the city on the transportation system plan. Then I was uh, helped kick off an arts committee there. I was on the planning commission for two and a half, three years, something like that. Then on the city council for two and a half years, and I've been the mayor for the last seven. Um, in that time, we have uh, passed one of the most aggressive climate action plans in the state and then have been taking some pretty significant steps to um, cause that to come to fruition. Um, we are investing about $52 million, it'll be more than that by the time we're done, uh, building out our bike and pedestrian infrastructure so that anyone from age eight to age 80 will be able to walk or ride anywhere in the city safely. Um, we're two weeks away from passing a pretty aggressive tree code that should not only protect trees, but cause a lot more trees to be planted. 
Um, we've also done a lot of work on affordable housing. We were, I think, the first city in the state to pass a construction excise tax for affordable housing. Um, and we are using those funds along with just working with partners to get more affordable housing built. We have 500 new units that will be coming online over the next handful of years. A uh, project I started practically the week I was elected uh, with Health, Housing, and Human Services down in Clackamas County. It's the, that, that area across from uh, the hospital there in Milwaukee where it looks like an old army barracks, mm -hmm. we call it Hillside. So it's currently housing 200 low-income families. It's on 16 acres. Hmm. We could easily, you know, house five times that. Um, but we're, we're building 500 new units there, uh, which, you know, as Khalifa pointed out, the costs of housing in Milwaukee are skyrocketing like they are in the rest of the metro region. Nobody's wages are keeping up with those increases. So, you know, one of the most critical things that a city can do to support its folks is to get housing built that's affordable. So we're not only addressing it on that end, but we're also, also two weeks away, because we combined these two, um, going to be passing, uh, changing our housing zoning laws. So there will no longer be any single family housing zones in Milwaukee. Everything in Milwaukee will be medium density. So that means fourplexes, townhomes, cottage clusters, that whole missing middle realm is going to be allowed on every single lot in Milwaukee. Uh, some cities are, you know, playing fast and loose with the state rules around that and trying to limit it as much as they can. We, we were one of the few cities that supported it because it's something I've been pushing for for a long time. Uh, and we're going beyond what the state's requiring on that. And we're reducing some parking requirements in that so that uh, that housing is even more affordable. So the goal is to, to hit a housing market that the market's going to pay for rather than all government subsidized housing um, that, you know, maybe we'll get some units that are 300, 350,000 instead of the 700,000 that everything new is right now. Great. And taking the parking out just lowers the cost of construction. It does. Yeah. And, and that's, it's not, we're, dis, we're not disallowing parking, right. we're just, it's not required. You're just not requiring, so sure. So if, if, if that's, you know, if the developer decides to add parking, they can do that. Sure. If the owner later decides to put parking, they can do that, but we're just not requiring. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so let's say you're elected. Uh, first bill you're going to pass, or at least the first bill you're going to introduce. First one that I would introduce? Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, I do think it would have to be something around housing and homelessness. Um, you know, I think that this is a crisis that's happening, it's in front of us, it's not just in Portland, it's all over the state, um, it's definitely an, an issue in our district, um, you know, it's the homeless and the houselessness that's even in front of us that we're not really paying attention to, it's not always in these big encampments, right? Sometimes it's as simple as somebody that's sleeping in the car in a parking lot. Um, so there's definitely people in our district that are experiencing that, and I think for me, it would be working with stakeholders to make sure that we were putting together a comprehensive bill that was really treating it as a crisis that it is. Um, I think we, we should be looking at things like actually doing potentially a homeless census where we're actually trying to figure out who is on the streets, what are their needs, and how do we move them forward? Because I think until we actually measure it and have real data to be able to do that and potentially fund case managers to be able to work with these folks to get them back on their feet and be able to be in permanent housing and you know back into sort of living society, I think that that's stuff we need to be looking at. I think that's going to take a comprehensive approach. It's going to take a lot of stakeholders around the table, but I think that's the, one of the very first issues we need to tackle. Great. Mr. Gamba, same question. Sure. There's so many issues, right? Um, but we've been working on a bill for the last two years. It was called the REACH Code Bill. Uh, Milwaukee was, we initiated that with uh, some other stakeholders. And what that's morphed into during the last short session was um, a committee, basically, to look at, okay, what should we do around building energy when it comes to climate? Because we haven't touched it. It's the one the one part that Oregon hasn't done anything about, and it's 40% of our greenhouse gas. Wait, for construction? N no, how, building energy. Building energy. Building energy. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. Yeah. you're yeah. right that the REACH code bill was predominantly about new construction, right? It was to allow cities to cause new construction to be more energy efficient. What I'm hoping is going to come out of this bill is going to be more robust, or this committee is going to be more robust. Uh, not only my goal, and I've been working with the unions because the unions were the ones that submarined that bill. 
So I've already been meeting with them and, and my goal is to cause it to be a statewide bill rather than cities can opt in because that's what the unions hated. They didn't want to have different versions because it, it, it kind of didn't make sense because they're already doing that. There are a lot of builders that are building to reach code. When you say the unions, this is the hard hats? Uh, it was the it was the trades. Trades, yeah. Yeah, uh, and even but even the electricians joined them, which was weird because they stood to benefit really in the long term. From yeah. But what they said, and and it was the electricians that convinced me. They said, look, we, we just the, the fewer types of building codes we have to deal with, the better. We're we're happier. There. We agree with you that the building that the it the buildings need to be more energy efficient and more electrified. We agree with that, but we want to see it statewide. So that is what I think is going to come out of that bill. I'll be pushing for there to be some work around retrofitting existing stock in addition to that. I think that's one of the ways that we can start to push a little equity into this, is causing low-income housing, BIPOC housing, to be some of the first buildings that we start to retrofit, right? Um, because energy bills are skyrocketing for, for those folks, um, you know. Anyway, yeah, it's it's a big it's a big piece. So if if we can put those two things together into one bill, that would probably be my first bill. Although mental health care, we rank what is it last or second to last, depending on which metric you use in the country, and that is absolutely a part of the <laughs> houseless problem. You know, my cops are picking people up every day, take them to the hospital. Twenty four hours later, they're back on the street, and it's rinse and repeat. Or, you know, we need long term care. We need the social service workers, people with master's degrees that are being paid, you know, barely above minimum wage to do that job. They have caseloads of like 60 people. That's not going to work. We're losing those. They're quitting. They're mm -hmm. burning out. So we have to give those people the support they need. We have to pay them what they're worth so that that part of it is getting handled. But then we need long-term care. We don't have, I mean, there's folks that, you guys know this, they sit in jails. They're, they're supposed to be going to the mental health hospital. Sure, they end up, they end but up, they end up sitting in a jail because there's no beds. Yeah. So we've, this is the problem we've known about for a long time. Why it hasn't been handled, I'm not real clear, but that's that's a piece. And why why move to the house now? I was thinking that same thing. <laughs> Me? Yeah. To instead of remaining mayor. Because I turn out. Oh, is it two, two, two terms? Two terms. Got it. Two and that terms. would be next year or this year? No, that's January. Got it. I'm, I'm okay. done in January. So either either way, I was done. Representative but, Power had this seat until very recently, right? Right. Is she endorsing this race? She is not. Okay. Uh, have, either she, you, have you either of you saw her endorsing? I talked to her, and she, she said early on that she wasn't going to endorse anybody. Try to change your mind? Nope. Uh, how much money have you raised? Uh, 32. Who's your biggest donor? It's either one of the, um, maybe, uh, maybe Bob Walsh. What do you think he wants? More affordable housing. Okay. How much money have you raised? Just around ten thousand dollars right now. But we're stacking some endorsements. We hope we'll bring some money as well. Who's your biggest donor? My biggest donor right now is the Oregon Trial Lawyers Association, and then under that's my cousin Brandon. What do you think? Well, I don't want to know what your cousin Brandon wants, but I'm actually curious. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the Oregon I'm Trial Lawyers? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think the Oregon Trial Lawyers want? Yeah, I appreciate it. They want to be able to defend folks who need defending and the, the ability to make sure that people are held accountable, whether that's sort of um, police, you know, police unions and police officers who are brutalizing people on the street, whether that's um, governments or whether that's corporations who are trying to exploit workers and exploit uh, individuals as well. Is there a vote that Representative Power took that you would have taken a different vote on? I mean, without having examined all of our votes, I doubt that there's many votes that I would have taken a different vote on. Um, you know, I think the only thing that's different about me, once again, in this position is just sort of the experience and the sort of point of view and the worldview that I, I would bring to this position to sort of have a slightly different value set than most people typically have when they're making those votes. Same question. It's a tough one. It, the, the, the tough vote that they all took a few years ago on PERS. Yeah. Um, I might have held the line on that one. I well, you're behind a closed door with Tina Kotek. I hear she can be quite. She's persuasive. brutal. Yeah. No, I, I, I have friends that were crying in that room. <laughs> um, you know, but we made a bargain with those folks, right? When we hire teachers, they're not getting paid well, 
and we said, okay, here, this is your, this is what, what you do get is a decent retirement. You get a, you know, it's not an amazing retirement. You, you can look at those PERS values. They're not, it's not like those people are going to go retire to Palm Springs. They're going to live, you know, very modest lives on their retirement. And we took a lot of that away from them. So we made this deal. This is why they took the job, potentially one of the reasons they took the job, and then we took that away from them in the name of money for education. Kids, yeah. You know, it's a bigger problem. We, we've allowed Betsy Johnson to back us in a, into a corner on that when what we should have done a long time ago is to fix our property taxes. I mean, the reason we are in the place we're in around schools, around fire districts, around park districts, cities, counties, the whole works is measures five and 50. They were a mess. And the, the legislature has not had the guts to go and address that since then. It's, it, you know, all of those things are going to come to a head eventually. Every city that's not growing like, you know, Hillsboro and Wilsonville and Happy Valley are mm -hmm. slowly circling the drain financially because everything, cops, asphalt, sewer pipes, that all goes up every year more than 3%. Mm -hmm. And that's, we get 3% a year increase. Yep. Doesn't matter that literally the property values in Milwaukee right now, if we were paying property taxes at market value, our budget would be double. Double what it is. The two of you want to ask me questions? Wow. I'm, I'm all right for now. So yeah, the fire district is suffering. I mean, they, yeah. they, you know, I just met with the chief a couple weeks ago and they're very concerned. And it's something that's got to be fixed. Um, would you, would either of you have done anything differently in the legislature around climate? Um, because what I hear is that um, everybody was really wanted a legislative solution. And of course we didn't get one because of the walkout. And then we had rulemaking through DEQ. Was there anything you could have brought to the legislature to make it work on this issue? I appreciate the governor's executive orders that at least are moving the ball, right? But A, they could be rescinded by the next governor. And there is a very real possibility that we will get a governor that will do that very thing. I wasn't in the rooms. I wasn't in those conversations. I know Karen is a very level-headed person and I know she gets along well with almost everybody. I knew Republicans down there that respected her. So maybe I couldn't have done better, but my MO in all of these things has been to sit down one-on-one -on -one with individual people and say, look, for you, really, why, why, what, what's your issue with this? For a lot of those folks, it's a talking point, right? It's, it's red meat to their base. They don't really have mm -hmm. an opposition to it. And frankly, a lot of those districts are what burned two years yeah. ago, right? Yep. So they have to actually care on some level about this stuff. So. To some degree, that's what I would do differently, but I pray to God that we pass the ballot measure that's being, uh, getting signatures right now, which would say that, you know, any legislator with more than X number of unexcused absences cannot run again in the next election. Yeah, the, the, the anti-walkout measure. Yeah. yeah, which then solves the quorum problem. It, I it, it addresses it. Right. Some it people will be willing to like lose their seats in order to, to make a point, I suppose. And I think that that's actually what it's going to ultimately come down to. And I feel like what I would potentially bring in, in this position is that like we have to get people actually excited and engaged in the system. For too long, people are just like tuning out, right? Like we have all of these issues and we've had D's in, in charge for a long time. So it matters what Democrats are sending to office. And I think part of that is actually having sort of constituents and communities that are excited about actually getting involved in the political process. And some of that's turning the heat up on Republicans when they aren't walking out, right? Like, I think part of it is like having the quorum sort of thing addressed and part of it's literally running campaigns against them that are like as fervent in the media sort of um, buzz as they are, right? Like one of the things the Republicans do really well is message and communicate and piss people off. One thing that the Democrats haven't done as well is be able to message from our values and our principle sets and talk about the facts that it, it is those communities that are burning. So they do have skin in this game and we should be getting them involved and they should be not electing the same people if they are literally putting our, our futures and our lives on the line. And I think that like we need to have people who have the skin in the game, who are passionate enough and that people are seeing that passion, that they're getting involved. And I also do think it is being able to have those conversations with Republicans, right? And like 
Dem Democrats were sort of really good about weed for a long time, and then the Republicans started getting good about weed. But it's one of those things where you have to be able to have those conversations, even when you fervently disagree, to figure out is there any move for any room for alignment. And I feel like part of that is having sort of. Um, you know, the background of being able to work across the aisle and be able to understand that even if I disagree with you on 99 things, if I can agree with you on one, then I'll work with you on that issue. And I think that that's something that's really important is putting the pressure on them while still trying to have, it's still a good working relationship with them. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, this is so, this is, hasn't come up much, but um, you know, when I talk to people about coming to Portland, visiting Portland, and a lot of people here will say, there's no reason to come right now because the city just looks like shit. Um, with trash everywhere. What, is, what has been your, what, how have you, have you had to tackle this issue of just garbage in the streets as mayor of Milwaukee? And what, is there anything you can do in, in, in the legislature that might help us clean up this thing that, I mean, it, it haunts everybody who lives here. I mean, we spend a lot of Saturdays cleaning up trash on I-205 and around our neighborhoods. We just do it volunteer. And I think more and more people are doing that, but I mean, this is turning into like, a big problem. Yeah, I, you know, I hate to speak ill of another mayor, but Ted's in over his head, and, and the form of government that they have is a nightmare. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I hope you guys get that passed so that you yeah. can get back to some kind of a sane form of government, but w we have handled it differently, so um, our cops work really hard one-on-one -on -one to try and get each homeless person attached to services. We have we have a medic that works out of our fire department that helps them if with their meds, sometimes that's their issue. Uh, helps them with medical issues that they have. Um, we do a good job, our, our public works department does a great job of cleaning up after camps or, you know, after they've left camps and they're just, it's just trash. Um, we, um, but it's, you know, it's still there. It's just not as visible in Milwaukee as it is in Portland. Um, I think the way Eugene has handled it is actually really smart, and that's, we're, we're gonna be, well, we're talking. Everything takes forever. But we're working towards um, doing a camp like Eugene has done, where they're very organized camps. They have what they call Conestogas. Hmm. Um, it's, it's basically a, you know, a, a livable unit. There's showers available, there's a kitchen facility available, there's bathrooms available, there's trash, right? And so they're organized. Um, different models are, work different ways. Some of them you have to be sober, some of them you don't necessarily have to be sober. Um, we're working on, on doing one of those in Milwaukee because it is growing even in Milwaukee, even though we are working really hard to get folks, you know, handed off to the social, services folks that can are you part of um i keep forgetting the name of sorry get to zero uh, I, I, thank you. yes i yeah. love that model and and, and the i'm not yet i proposed it to my council and they all kind of went oh another thing like that uh, but it's a, it's a brilliant concept because what that's doing is one on one you are literally creating a list of every individual by name and their needs and you start to work through it in a very methodical um, way. I, part of the problem here is, you know, folks move around, it's all fluid, trying to get services, trying to, if somebody does have a health care issue, if they have a mental health issue, if they have a um, whatever drug abuse issue, they're not getting the services they need because they're not identified, right? They're not connected like that. So trying to get folks in an organized camp is is a good first step and then yeah a concept or i i can't remember what's called either but it's zero is in the name built for zero built for, built for zero can yeah. i get your 45 second review of the safe rest village model both fiscally and just sort of functional wise well as it's rolled out or as it's Theoretically supposed to work. But let's go theoretically. <laughs> oh, I was going to say the exact opposite. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in both, but I can imagine what you're. <laughs> you're <laughs> it hasn't rolled out well. Yes. Um, I, I, I mean, that's kind of what I'm describing, right? The that's kind of stuff is, or are the theoretical, right? Yeah. Right. So the, the, that's what Eugene has done, and if you so go why, there, so why is Portland fucking it up? <laughs> well, I thought I answered that question already too. Uh, 
Do you well, think it's the commission? A, a their, their problem, it, it boils down to that. Because look, I mean, if you think about that, just, just, you've got people running departments that have zero background, zero education, zero anything in that thing. I mean, I can remember when Chloe Daly was given um, uh, transportation, Peabody. She had nothing. She sat, we sat for three hours and I walked her through a whole bunch of stuff because I've been doing transportation now since for 15 years. And then she you know, came to enough JPEC meetings that she kind of got up to speed. But that's a crazy form of government. You know, if we're going to do that where we're electing commissioners, elect the commissioner, right? Elect the commissioner of transportation, elect the right. police commissioner, elect the, right? Because then you're electing, ho hopefully, somebody with some kind of background in that. So that wasn't 45 seconds, I know. But I actually want to, like, it, it, I want to get your response. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I mean, I think, like, the commissioner store flat style of government is definitely an issue, but it also is, once again, representation. Like, M Mayor Ted Wheeler's never been homeless, he's never been on food stamps. He doesn't understand what it's like to actually be on the bottom rungs of society, right? Like, that's where I come from. Like, we have people on our campaign who have experienced homelessness. Like, that's when you get policies that actually get done. When people who are actually from that life are working to actually get it done. And I think it's really cool to talk about all the sort of the nuances of our form of government. But ultimately, it's a representative government only when the people are representative of the communities that we're trying to represent. Right. So I do think it is very important that we are putting people in these positions that actually understand the issues and have people around them that understand them like inherently, not just on a policy sort of you know dynamic. Have you been following the Measure 110 money? I've not been following the money specifically, but definitely the conversation around it. Do you know about what's happening with the money and what's not happening? For um, I understand it, it sounds like you might. Go ahead. Well, so I, I, I was just meeting with the Multnomah Sheriff the other day um, about a different topic, but we, we got into that question. The, even the providers that were providing service before are not getting funded to the level that they used to get funded, let alone ramping a massive amount of, of new services up, which was the whole concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, the model was Portugal, right? Yeah. In Portugal, when they, when they legalized drugs, they put a lot of money into getting folks the treatment they needed, a lot. And, and they, I mean, their addiction rates dropped precipitously over, what was it, six years yeah. or something. It was really fast. Well, so what's your, so what I understand is that the money is, is stuck. It was supposed to come out January 1st. It hasn't come out. And this gets to your point a little bit because it sounds to me like there's a tussle between the board that was set up with people who have lived experience and people who do um, addiction recovery service and, you know, very on the ground people on the board. There's a tussle between them and the staff at OHA who are the experts. And it's the experts versus lived experience. And I think, I feel like I'm seeing this over and over. These things are clashing. What is? How do you make this work? We've got to re We've got to be able to rebuild the systems ultimately, and that takes like actually listening to the people with the lived experience. Because but isn't this the rebuild system? Well, I mean, I think if if it is, if it is the technocrats that ultimately are all all completely in charge and not listening to the lived experience of people, then I don't. I wouldn't say that that's actually happening. Yeah. Right. Like we need to be listening to the people with lived experience because they're telling us how it will work. Us saying, well, that's not how it works according to this code doesn't work for those people, mm -hmm. right? That's why it is important to have those commissions set up so that you do have people with lived experience, but then you actually have to listen to them, right? Not, we're the experts, listen to us. Like, oh, good point. Maybe we could tweak this thing to make that work, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be in the business of how can we get it done, not why we can't get it done. And that's typically what all politics ends up being. These are the ways in which it's always been done and why we can't do it, not, you're right, that's a great point. Let's figure out, using the system as it stands now, how we can use the fulcrums and the leverage of power to actually benefit the people who need it the most. So the other system where this is in place is PSEF, right? Where you've got a grant committee that has people with lived experience and who are you know, on the ground facing sure. these issues. Yeah. And their performance has not been fantastic. How do you, how, has, has that lived up to your expectations, particularly? PSEF either? Yeah. And, and if not, why not, and what would you do? Maybe start here. I haven't been in those rooms, so <coughs> I, I don't want to throw stones at something that, that I haven't been involved in. Um, I, I'm just disappointed in, 
in what it hasn't achieved so far, and I think most people are. Um, yeah, okay. I, am, I, I don't have a direct criticism because yeah, okay. I haven't been in the rooms. So I've just started sort of being able to see a little bit behind the scenes of like foundation and grant work with my work at Brown Hope, uh, because we are primarily focused on black, brown, and indigenous community members and doing a lot of mutual aid product or projects. So like we have seen grants from a lot of different sort of um, a lot of different places, including Measure 110, including sort of PSEF. And I just think what's really important is that we are giving those folks the autonomy because I'm seeing on the, in the ground, on the ground, like real people who are getting impacted, who are so thankful that they were either able to take care of a rent check or able to just get another sort of month of bills paid, like any sort of help that they can get, right? And like, I literally get an inbox every day, probably half a dozen to a dozen or more people who are like, I just lost my job. I can't pay for my rent. My electric is going about to get shut off. These people are desperate and they're asking for help. And so like we are able to give them help because, you know, we've been able to build up a, you know, an organization that can funnel people the resources that we're able to work with from the sort of traditional world. And I think it's just really important once again that we're giving people who get it mm -hmm. the actual resources to do it and then just kind of step back and then take data, right? We need to be able to like, is it working? And then come back around. And then I also think it's really important that we're building sort of the back bench of those organizations because people with lived experience don't necessarily have the business acumen, sort of the nonprofit background, being able to do grant writing, right? But being able to sort of help start those organizations and get people inside that can help build that even with folks who have the lived experience, then you have the best of both worlds. You have people who have the lived experience, know what needs yeah, to happen. That's the dream. Yes, yeah. and then you have people who actually understand yeah. how to build those things and can make them make them work. It's a longer it's a longer term solution though. But he's yeah. totally right. I mean that's that's what is gonna need to happen on a lot of this stuff, right? We we are having really good success with peers on the houseless uh, issue if we could get those peers trained so they not only have the lived experience but now they have the, the technique the technology the the you know medical or if that's the case that they're working on background to be able to do more of the work that's a game changer yeah. and i think particularly on the mental health care world right can you picture that where we are starting to train folks that have the lived experience of being homeless in mental health care and so they're then the ones out there working with those folks. It would be powerful. Did you That's a great point, just real quick if I could, like, because on the mental health thing, like, we have so many folks who are in crisis right now. My wife's a mental health professional, so, but she works in like sort of private practice. Even people who are not in crisis can't get access to the system, right? right? right yeah. So we actually do have to put the money in and training and making sure that we have more mental health professionals in the system. Because right now, way too much demand, not enough supply. Yeah. And so we do need to make sure that we are, I love the idea of being able to bring folks from the community and give them that training, while at the same time, we straight up need to recruit more uh, mental health professionals and get them into the field ASAP because- But they have to be paid to where they want to stay. 1,000%, for sure. <laughs> My, my wife has worked at both a, a state hospital as well as in the prison system working on the mental health side so I definitely like agree with the need, the need for us to pay them well um, and make sure that we are retaining those folks and not having them burn out and making sure that we have a system that's actually sustainable for everyone. Sure, yeah. I mean think about it, a normal everyday shrink, right, that's got a private practice of well-heeled people, they have a shrink, right, because they're taking on the psychological load for a lot of these people they can't just absorb that permanently forever. Yeah. They have to have an outlet as well. Yeah, we have Aaron for that. <laughs> awesome. Can I, can I get a slot on Wednesday? I'm, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told that, that the, the therapy leaves something to be desired. Speaking of which, um, uncomfortable question time. Our newspaper has written in the past, Mayor Gamba, about um, you and vaccines, yeah. and particularly vaccine skepticism. Yeah. Uh, I think you objected at the time to our reporting about that issue. Yes, I did. Had, had the pandemic changed your views on that matter, and if so, how? No, because I was never anti-vax to begin with. I, I was promoting vaccines the second they were available. My conversation, so you have to understand the community that I was in, that I was having to have that conversation with. It was Waldorf mm. community. A lot of those folks are on the left, you know, so, Anti-vaxxers aren't, it's not a right-wing thing, right? We know. It's on both wings, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of those folks, not a majority, but enough of them are really strongly anti-vax. And there is data points that they can point to to say, look, see? And they're not wrong. But Wait, they're so, not wrong about what? Well, the data points that they point to. 
Um, the one with autism in vaccines? No, no, no not, not autism. Not okay. autism. The, the one data point that's relevant to vaccinating babies is that there's a lot of research that shows that when you vac put foreign antibodies that are live virus, not killed virus, see this is part of the problem. The US, the US started to switch away from killed virus to live virus because it was cheaper. So when you started to do that, you're introducing a live antibody into a child that doesn't even have an immune system that's built yet. So that's the data that they're pointing to, and then they're extrapolating all this other crap. For which diseases is that, are they using live virus? Which, which is that mumps, MMR vaccines? Um, now you're asking me to look back. But it's not COVID, years. it's something else. No, 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 okay. wait, no, no. Okay, and Actually, so you're yeah. saying that- COVID isn't even- So you're saying there is, a, there is a real issue with live vaccine in small children. Yes, and so they take that and then it spins out into all this other stuff. So in order to have those conversations, I had to not be, adamantly, you're wrong, right? I had to, my tone with them had to be open-minded. And that's what they found on Facebook was two conversations where I was being open-minded in these conversations, trying to get them moved along. It was a really unfair headline, and, but we won't go there. Um, I've never, I'm a National Geographic photographer for God's sakes. I've had every vaccine known to man. Right. You cannot travel the world as much as I have and not have 300 different kinds of vaccination. So I'm not anti-vax, never, never was. But I was dealing with a population that was significantly anti-vax. In Milwaukee? Sure. Yeah. Which water school was there? The Portland Water School. Oh, is it in Milwaukee? The Portland oh, Water School. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I run into the Portland Water School is not in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's a strange Okay. Thing. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> just, just, so I, just to keep being who I am. Sure. Where are you on COVID vaccines? We need to be vaccinating the world. We're not gonna solve COVID until everyone in the world, until we hit 70% worldwide, right? Uh, it's, it's a worldwide pandemic. That's the way they work, sure. right? They're gonna keep morphing and keep morphing and keep morphing as long as there are population densities for it to spread it. Until we vaccinate 70% of the planet, we are gonna live with this disease. It's that simple. That sounds sufficiently non-skeptical to me. Same, <laughs> same, same question. Uh, about the vaccines specifically. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I support vaccines. I support, um, I'm boosted all the way through. Um, I think that they, I was pro mandate. I think we should have done them earlier. I feel like this also is just, in general, once again, goes back to the representation thing for me because it's about people just not believing in government anymore. And this has been a 40-year plan of the Republicans, right? This, we're living in the logical conclusion of the Reagan era. Yep. Like Trump was part of that. And all of this vaccine skepticism and the inability to sort of, you know, go through news, sift through news, and be able to sort of see what's actually the truth versus the sort of smoke and mirrors, I think it's just all part and parcel of the same situation, which is we don't have people in government that get people to actually believe in it and engage. And that sort of brings us back away from this idea that it is we the people, not just some entity over here that's doing stuff bad to us, but actually our representatives who are supposed to be representing our ideas. Well, and, and think of how the people of color have been treated in this country in the medical realm, right? They used to experiment on, you know, introducing venereal diseases and all kinds of crazy experiments. They think of the things they did, the sterilizations. I mean, there's a good reason that people of color do not trust the medical establishment. Did really you, on that note, did you, did you think twice about getting into, I don't know who got in first, but I, I think, he, filed, I think he filed first. You were first. Did you have any uh, hesitation about getting into a race against a person of color? I absolutely In a legislature that needs people of color? I did. I did. Uh, to tell you the truth, when I met with Coleco, I wanted to fall in love. I walked in that coffee shop. My goal was to fall in love. I wanted to be able to go, cool, I will help you run. Um, and I like him, he's a nice guy. Um, and I think at some point he will probably be an outstanding um, legislator or mayor or whatever. My bottom line, the line, my line in the sand on everything is the climate. And if we need people, think about it, we are gonna walk into a legislature this next session that is 50% freshmen. Almost 50% freshmen. Think what it's going to take to wind that up to get anything done, let alone 
the kind of climate bills that we have to get across the line in the next eight years. Understood. Have, so he's saying you're not ready. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Uh, a couple different ways. One I would say is a native Hawaiian, I very much understand in my bones what it's like to live in harmony with Mother Earth. Right? And that is a cultural thing that I think, once again, gets to this representation conversation about having indigenous and native voices in places of power. Because I, I agree that you know, Mark has done a really great job on this issue. He's like embracing this as the number one thing and has done a lot of actual really good work on it. While at the same time, it's, it's kind of, um, it's slightly patronizing to act as if I can't get caught up to speed on the policies around this stuff just because I haven't been spending my life in it. Right? Mm -hmm. I've spent my life, the last 10 years, working for underrepresented communities, trying to end cannabis prohibition nationally and here in Oregon. And so that took a lot of time to actually learn that. And I'm a quick study. So I do think that I'm going to be able to hit the ground running, as Mark says, with climate change. But I also, once again, think I'm going to bring a perspective and bring other people to the table who are not typically part of this conversation. Because it's very important that we have a very critical conversation about the climate crisis. But it's every bit as important that we make sure that black, brown, and indigenous communities are a part of that conversation and currently in Oregon that is not really the case and so I do think that like you know I respect Mark for the work that he's done while at the same time I think that I bring the passion the vibrant the vibrant sort of mentality to this and people around me who can help me get there great Mark did you think about running for the federal the new district house representatives district the sixth yeah no my intention was to run in the fifth against Schrader again Oh, okay. He's still the worst Democrat in Congress. And then what? But we decided to change it. But well, right. when it when it we redrew, redrew the lines, and I saw the map, I thought about that, and I went, okay, Jamie's in this district. I need to talk to Jamie. So I reached out to Jamie McLeod Skinner, and we talked for an hour and a half, and we sat down, we did the math. Okay, who who's got the better shot against Schrader, right? Mathematically, because there's. And at the end of us doing that, I said, Jamie, it's you. It's clear you've got the better shot of because this. Because she's? Because she'll own Bend, oh, right? 30% okay. yes. of the voters is all her, okay. right? She's won that. She won that against Walden. She won that against Shamia. She's, she owns Bend. So that's 30% of the vote tied up. I would be having to work for that vote just like I would for anything else, right? Just like Trader would. He's got the money advantage, big money advantage. So I would be, I would have an uphill battle, whereas she has 30% off the bing, and all we got to do is build her another 21%, and we got this race. Mm. And it's been effective to have me outside of the race because I've been able to engineer. Like, I don't know if you know this, but the Democratic Party in four of the counties voted to endorse Jamie against Kurt Schrader, which has never in history happened before. Never. Mm. They don't typically endorse against incumbents. It was interesting. So I was able to make that happen because I was not yeah. running. So that was a pragmatic, totally pragmatic. And the, my most important thing is that we not have a Democrat in Congress that is basically anti-climate work. So this has been a fascinating conversation, genuinely. And I apologize, we got to wrap this up, but we have m many hours to go today oh, before we get to go home. So um, I want to end with what's our call our fun question. Okay. But before I do, uh, can I get your ages, please? Uh, 34. 56. <laughs> 62. Um, 63 in a week, two weeks. Oh, good. Well, that's good to know. So you're 63 on April, April 19. On April 19. The okay. day I vote in, the tree code and the uh, anti-racist zoning code will be my birthday. That's important because our issue comes out on the 27th. There you go. So we have this, what we call a fun question. And the fun question is, is sometimes fun for us. But the, <laughs> the goal here is to, is to get to know you as people a little bit. And this time the question is, is was, was there a moment or what was the moment when you felt a sense of joy as life returned to normal after the pandemic? Now granted, the pandemic is not over. I'm not making the claim that it is. But, I, and I realize we probably have multiple waves coming and those affect more communities more than others. But that said, here we are sitting in a room we're not wearing masks. We're having a conversation in person, essentially something that was unimaginable a year ago. So was there a moment for you that you felt like a sense of relief or joy in engaging back in human interaction again? 
Honestly, for me, it's campaign related. It was knocking on my first door because that hasn't happened in years. I used to knock doors for other candidates. I've never done it for myself, but knocking that first door and having a political conversation face to face, not Facebook, not Twitter, not Instagram for the first time in many years. Like that was just a really a big highlight for me. I'll, I'll always remember Rita, not just because of the conversation we had. She also ended up giving us $100 unsolicited, came back to sort of my notifications later and saw that. So that, I think that once again, just sort of shows like, you know, the ability to connect with folks and be able to have the conversation and meet them on their level is what people have been waiting for, right? And I think everybody else has sort of got that same sense of just waiting to be able to, you know, have a conversation with somebody face to face. So that's that's what it was for me. Great. It was so gradual. I don't know that I had that. Um, but there was a moment a couple of months ago where a group of old friends in Milwaukee that we we've all we just all ended up, happened to end up down at the beer store at the same time. <laughs> and it was, you know the beer store in Milwaukee? No, but... It's, it's, it's actually a bar. It's, it's a oh, yeah, yeah. 12 tap kind of bar with <laughs> vegan burgers and... Yeah, yeah, that, and yeah, yeah, I've heard of this. So we just all happened to end up in there. And it was just, we all just had huge smiles on our faces because we was like, wow, I haven't seen you without a mask in two years. And I haven't seen, you know, a lot of the people we hadn't seen. And we could hug people. It was amazing. That was probably if they had to pick a moment. That's a great choice, both of you. Thank you so yeah, much for coming. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for all your hard work. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for your time. Oh, Thanks sorry. for all your hard work. So good to meet you. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Yeah.